So I work in the general field of synthetic biology, which is a kind of a new uh, field of research which uses a lot of the technologies and techniques we've uh, developed for engineering more traditional systems like electrical systems or mechanical systems. And we try to bring that uh, kind of reliability and design strategies into biology, which is a kind of a new concept since biology has been very difficult and traditionally to engineer. Um, we've used uh, synthetic biology-based techniques in a variety of uh, different diseases. And specifically, uh, one of the things we've been focusing on is trying to develop new technologies for treating biofilms and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So in that regard, the work generally focuses around uh, engineering viruses known as bacteriophages and giving them uh, special abilities to destroy biofilms and destroy antibiotic-resistant bacteria. We are focusing on the biofilm and antibiotic resistant bacteria areas because uh, we think they're areas of very high clinical need. Um, infectious diseases traditionally, uh, at least in the last 30 or 40 years, has been thought of a, as a solved problem. We've invented antibiotics. They used to be generally very effective. But in recent times, you know, we've noticed that uh, as antibiotic resistance increases and as um, more and more uh, medical devices start to be implanted into patients that the problem of biofilms and antibiotic resistant bacteria is growing much greater. At the same time, a lot of pharmaceutical companies have been decreasing their antibiotic resistance or biofilm type of research. And so there's like a critical need at this point where patients are in need of new antimicrobial treatments, but there are not that many coming down the pipeline. Biofilms to us are communities of microorganisms that like to live on surfaces. So these can be composed of bacteria, or yeast or other types of microorganisms. And in general, they, f they like to stick to surfaces and they form these communities where they can protect themselves from eradication, can be persistent for a long period of time. There's a, an increasing recognition that biofilms play a role in chronic diseases. And uh, the reason for that is that biofilms are very difficult to eradicate. Um, they live on surfaces, they produce extracellular materials that can defend themselves against um, human immune cells or antibiotics. And therefore, they're very difficult to remove. And once they form on a surface, they're very difficult for your body or for drugs to kill them. Um, examples of this can include uh, infections of uh, bone, infections of your heart valves, um, infection of the urinary tract, in which bacteria can colonize uh, these surfaces in the human body and live there for long periods of time. Um, I like to generally think of bacterial biofilms kind of like fruit jello. That's kind of the analogy I like to talk about. And the reason for that is if you think about fruit jello, um, where you have the individual pieces of fruit embedded in this gelatinous material, the biofilm cells, the bacterial cells, are like the fruit inside the jello. And they produce materials, for example, polysaccharides, uh, DNA, all types of different materials that form this gelatinous layer that surrounds them and provides structure for them to live in. Um, depending on the species of the bacteria, if you're talking about E. coli or uh, Staphylococcus species or Pseudomonas species, the type of extracellular material they produce is different. But they all have the common uh, idea and point, which is that they provide some kind of protection and provide some stabilization structure for the uh, rest of the community. The life cycle of a bacterial biofilm is pretty interesting. So it usually involves some type of bacteria that can swim around, um, we call planktonic culture, which is in liquid, and they're not stuck to any surfaces. They swim around until they find a surface that they like, and then they stick to that surface, and they start growing on that surface and forming more and more complex structures as they grow. At a certain point, when the biofilm has grown to a certain size, it reaches it's a mature state. At that point, it can shed bacteria that kind of can swim to other locations. This happens in um, human cells. Uh, the human body also happens out in the environment. Uh, and the conditions that are necessary for biofilm formation are essentially like a surface that the bacteria would like to live on and uh, the bacteria needs to be able to produce the right types of materials so we can stick to those types of surfaces. Biofilms are difficult to eradicate types of infections for a variety of different reasons. Um, the first reason is just by the purely that they live on surfaces. So if you think about it, if you have a bacteria floating around in a liquid and your immune cell comes by and tries to eat it, it's very easy for the immune cell to kind of reach around the bacteria and eat it. As opposed to if you're trying to clear something off of the surface, there's no easy way for your immune cells to kind of get around the infection. It's can't, it can't really flank the type of infections. So that's one kind of big problem in terms of trying to eradicate biofilms from any surface. Another thing is that when a biofilm forms, it tends to produce these extracellular materials that can either prevent the penetration of uh, things like bacteriophages or immune cells deep into the biofilm. 
The third thing is that when biofilms form, a lot of these cells adopt what is called a persistent state in which they kind of shut down. They're not very metabolically active. And as a result, a lot of the drugs that we use, like antibiotics, can't really kill those cells. A lot of the antibiotics we use uh, actually target actively dividing cells. And so if a cell is kind of just sitting around, not dividing, not very active, then it's very hard for antibiotics to kill these types of cells. Some of our own research has shown that especially some of the antibiotics that are very active against killing bacteria can never sterilize an entire population. So let's say you start off with a culture of a million bacteria and you apply this very strong antibiotic. You may kill off the majority of the bacteria, but if, for example, uh, some of the studies we've done show that let's say you start off with a million bacteria, you may be able to kill uh, 999,000 of them, but you still have about 1,000 bacteria left which are kind of immune to the antibiotics at this point, they can adopt a persistent state. And once you remove the antibiotics, they can start forming again and growing into a biofilm. So the presence of uh, persister cells and the inability for us to really completely eradicate a biofilm leads to things like antibiotic resistance and fu future biofilm formation that can be very difficult to clear at a later point in time. There are many theories on where how different microbes can start working with each other, and the limitation is that we don't necessarily have great technologies by which we can study these. Um, there are several mechanisms by which this might work. For example, uh, bacteria can produce these molecules called quorum sensing molecules, and they produce these when the bacteria grow to a significant concentration. And it kind of signals to their friends, like a bacterial cell will tell its friends, oh, now we've received we've reached a certain concentration, maybe we should switch into a different state, like a biofilm state or a virulent state. And it's been found that actually different types of bacteria can communicate with each other by producing different types of these quorum sensing molecules. And so quorum sensing is a big component of what people are trying to study now in terms of polymicrobial type of biofilms. In other situations, uh, different microbes may have kind of more of a symbiotic relationship where one microbe might produce a nutrient that the other one likes and vice versa. And therefore, they would like to form a, a biofilm where they're in close proximity to each other and they can uh, both have uh, increased survival because they live in a biofilm together. The third thing may be that uh, different microbes uh, produce uh, different factors that can help protect each other from extracellular insults. For example, a, uh, one bacteria may produce a certain type of polysaccharide that another one doesn't. And in these polymicrobial biofilms, they may, they may produce uh, different types of um, polysaccharides that add increased protection for the entire community as a whole. And the last thing that people like to talk about in terms of polymicrobial biofilms is that because these different cells are in close proximity with each other, they're in an ideal situation where one bacterial species can transfer genes to another one and they can share genetic elements that can promote survival. Um, one of these survival elements are antibiotic resistance genes, for example, that can be traded between bacteria and cause antibiotic resistance to spread through a community of different types of species. Gene transfer can occur between bacteria or between bacteria and non-bacterial species. Um, a lot of the studies have been done between bacteria because it's, you know, there's a huge diversity of bacteria that have antibiotic resistance and even just studying that reservoir of antibiotic resistance genes is uh, quite interesting already. Yeah. In terms of chronic infections, I think that's an one of the ideal indications for a bacteriophage because usually at that point, the bacteria that are involved have been subjected to multiple rounds of antibiotic treatment. They're probably resistant to a lot of antibiotics at that point. They've probably formed a very thick biofilm that's very difficult to treat. And at that point, you probably have culture data where you can identify the types of bacteria that you're going after. So these would be things like prosthetic device infections, joint infections, uh, you know, chronic endocarditis. You could have pseudomonas infections in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, you could have chronic urinary tract infections. You know, biofilms are actually very intricately re related to the problem of antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is a topic I think a lot of people have heard about a lot more in the popular press. So antibiotic resistant bacteria are essentially infections that uh, are difficult to treat because these bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. It's a very basic concept, but it's really spread significantly throughout the medical community. Um, examples include MRSA infections, but there are a lot of other, for example, gram-negative or gram-positive bacteria that have acquired genes that make them immune to a lot of the antibiotics we've developed. Now the issue is that in the last 30 years, investment in developing new antibiotics has really decreased significantly. And therefore, um, and clinicians are very restrained at this point in terms of what antibiotics are effective at treating um, these types of infections. The link between biofilms and antibiotic resistant bacteria is quite close in that biofilms because of the presence of persister cells and being able to trade genes between each other, 
can often have an increased level of antibiotic resistance. And so I think moving forward, the type of technologies we need to develop and the type of research that we need to do needs to really focus on both of these problems together, biofilms as one distinct entity, but also as antibiotic resistance and how they interplay with each other to cause human disease.